Hello, Modim Lesimcha. I hope everybody is enjoying and feeling well, enjoying this Cholamoid Pesach, and I hope everybody's feeling well. And there's only good news with all of you and your families. I am addressing this to the teens who I look forward to seeing soon, whenever that will be. And uh, the purpose of the this call is to address some of the pain that we're going through as a nation, as Kla Yisrael, as a world, really. And most recently, with the loss of our own Mr. Kushner. He was like the, the father of the zone. The Kushners themselves, of course, they run the zone. They were here, are here, and they they put in so much time and effort and work into the zone. It was amazing every summer how we saw all of them, the boys and the girls, and the boys camp and the girls camp. And on visiting day, I used to always look forward to chatting with Mr. Kushner. He would come under that tent where I'd be sitting. It was so pleasant, he's so informative and so lively and it was so unbelievable to be able to talk to him and the Baruch Chaim to his wife. And now, sadly, we lost Mr. Kushner. And uh, I can't address the Kushners yet because they are in a different league. And hopefully we'll talk to them after the Chag and to share in their grief with them and give them a chance to talk and express themselves. But today I want to talk to the teens to discuss how do we face life? How do we go on and face what is going on? How do we, especially, how do we be happy during this Chag of Pesach? So, first of all, I want to know that you want to tell you that today is the third day of Cholomite Pesach, 2020. It's Monday afternoon. And if you look outside, it's dark, cloudy, black, gloomy, Torrential rains, unbelievable winds, and it may make me feel a little bit down, but we know that tomorrow the sun will shine. We know that life is it moves on. The situations that we find ourselves all the time are not situations that are life sustained. Like for life, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit, it's today and tomorrow, things will be good. So we're going through a tough time. What always kept the Jewish people, we went through a lot of tough times. The Holocaust, the Mitzrayim, the Spanish Inquisition. I can't tell you how many times there's no other nation that went through so many horrific times as the Jewish people. But we always had an unbelievable faith in Hashem. We knew Hashem will pull through. Hashem is maybe acting out against us now for a, for a time, for a reason. He wants us to do something, but we knew that it's not forever. We always knew, we always trust that Hashem will, will take us out. We know that uh, we were in Mitzrayim, imagine for so many hundreds of years, imagine being in slavery, being killed, no food. We came down to Mitzrayim with Yaakov, Avinu, his sons, Yosef was there in control. It was a different world when we came down. But after time, as time passed, little by little, Yaakov's children died out, Yaakov and his sons and Yosef. And before we knew it, we were slaves. And we were there for hundreds of years being tortured, killed, beaten, overworked. And yet we knew that Hashem, maybe some men weren't so trustworthy. The women, of course, were the main people who trusted Hashem. The women said to their husbands, the husbands said, why should we have more children? You're bringing more children into slavery. But the woman said, what do you mean? This is not forever. This is now. Hashem will come back one day and take care of us. So meanwhile, we have to go on in life the way we're supposed to go. That's one of the reasons why we have so many fours. By the pace of Seder, we have four sons. We have four questions. We have four cups of wine. Why do we have four so many? Four terms of redemption to represent the four Imos, Sora, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, our four mothers who were at the forefront of Klai Yisrael, they put it into our genes to have trust, and that's why the Gemara says, because of the Nashim Tzitkani, it's supposed to have the holy woman, we came out of Mitzrayim. So the woman had faith, but imagine so many years, we didn't give up. This is really what Pesach, Pesach is here for a, a lesson of trust in Hashem, and believing in Hashem. That's what Pesach is about. 
We know the matzah. It's amazing. The matzah, we eat matzah. And at the beginning of the Seder, we say, Halach Ma'anya, this is the poor man's bread that our fathers ate in Mitzrayim. It represents the matzah in the beginning. It's humble. It's, there's no ingredients. It's very simple. Flour and water. It represents what we ate in Mitzrayim. Power fed us with matzah in Mitzrayim because it was economical. He was able to feed a whole nation with a very little, a little flour and water, no ingredients, no eggs, no seasoning. It took very quickly to make it. Didn't have to wait till it rises. Rises, and it was something that we had in Mitzrayim. It represents slavery. At the beginning of the seder, it represents slavery. But at the end of the seder, when we finish Magid, we say, "Matzah, what do we eat this matzah for?" Because we didn't have time to bake cakes until Hashem came and quickly redeemed us from Mitzrayim. It represents freedom, right, matzah, at the end of the Seder. So the pace of Seder takes us really from the beginning till the end, takes us from slavery to freedom. To contrast, we know that black and white, we like a black and white cooking. We like sweet sweet and sour. We like hot and cold. You like to have a good, freezing good ice cream on a hot brownie. But the contrast brings out the taste. When you ask a good question, if I point to one side and then we understand the question, I'll understand the answer much better. So I want to end with two stories. The first story is about a teenage girl who says that the best part of her life, the greatest moment in her life, was when she was taken away from her mother as they came into Auschwitz and they were separated. One line for the healthy and young people, and one line for the old and feeble. And when she was taken away from her mother to one line and her to the other line, it was the best moment in her life. How could that be? How is it possible? She lived, this young girl, teenager at the time, she lived through the Holocaust, and she settled, settled in Israel later on, she built a family, and she says she'll never forget that moment. It was the best moment. They said, how could that be? And she said, I'll tell you why. Because I was always the second fiddle to my older sister. My older sister was more talented than me. She was more put together. She could sew, she could bake, she could cook. She was a fine student. And me, I was a troublemaker. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I didn't make it so. I always thought that my, my parents loved my sister better than me. But when I was taken away by the Holocaust from my mother, my mother saw them grab me away and she screamed, I can't live without her. She's my whole life. If you take her, then just kill me. And this young girl said, it was the last time I saw my mother, but I'll never forget those words. I never thought that I was anything good. I never thought that it was anything special. I'll never forget that I really mattered to my mother, like my older sister. That's why it was the best one. So you see an amazing thing that what could be, what should be somebody's worst moment in their life, to her, it was the best. And it really depends how you look. It depends on your outlook. This is an amazing story. This is the same thing by us. We're going through a hard time. But it could be the hard time. could be the turning point in our life. It could be it makes us into a person. It makes us into a mature young lady that we're able to see things in a positive way. It's an amazing story. I want to end with this following story. I think we said this many times. A farmer had an old donkey. He had an old farm, and it was time to give up the farm. He was ready to sell it and get rid of all his animals. But he had an old donkey that's been by him, working so hard for so many, so many years. It was like his child, and he couldn't bear to put this donkey out of its misery. The donkey was old, and it wasn't able to do a lot, and he he had a hard time putting it in. He didn't know what to do. And one day, the donkey was walking by a well. There was a well that was close to the ground. There was a very small ridge above the ground, an inch, two, three inches. And it was a very large well, very wide, not so deep. And the donkey, being old as it was, it stumbled along past the well and it just tripped and fell into the well. The farmer saw his opportunity, was so excited, and he said to all his farmers, please, everybody grab a shovel, go around the well, and start shoveling and in sand into the well. And this way, I'll put my old donkey out of his misery. It'll just bury him alive, and I'm going to go in the house. I can't bear to see. I can't bear to hear he's crying. And you take care of it and bury this donkey. The donkey was calling out, help, help, save me. And instead of being saved, he saw all his farmers around the well shoveling in sand. He couldn't understand, what are you doing to me? It's going to cover him. What are you doing? 
help. That's what the, the donkey thought to himself. And suddenly, the donkey, the sand was getting heavy on its back, and it shook it off. It shook off the, the sand. And as he shook it off, the ground got higher. And as the ground got higher, he stepped up higher. And soon, after a whole bunch of sand was being thrown in, he was higher and higher and higher until he was able to step out of the well. Wow, he couldn't believe it. Look at that. Why I thought it was going to hurt me? It really, it saved me. And that's really our challenges. Our challenges are here to help us grow, help us to be better, not to make us lower, not to bury us. God doesn't send us challenges to, to make our life hard. So I'd like to end with this final, final story. It's a sad story somewhat, but it's an amazing lesson. We know that so many people passed away in New York and in the world, and in America, of course. I think 12,000 in the United States, I think, maybe more. So in New York, in Borough Park, there was a funeral chapel with bodies being waiting, waiting to be buried, waiting to make funerals. And this family, I forgot the last name, it just slipped my mind, but this family was called to come to the funeral chapel. 10 o'clock will be the funeral. Okay, they were coming, they're waiting, and then they rushed it in. Of course, they kept all the rules. They sat on separate benches. Not too many people came. 10, 12 people came. And the coffin was all in the front. And someone got up in the front and he said to Helim, and they all repeated after him. And then he said a few, a few good words for this Zaidi, for this grandfather, old, old, great grandfather. He lived through the Holocaust and he was so positive and he always ran away from honor. And he said a few words about him. And then, one by one, the family came up to the front to ask for forgiveness. Stand by the coffin. Please, Zaidi, please forgive me. Please, Pa, forgive me. Please, Elta Zaidi, great Zaidi, great grandfather, please forgive me. When they all sat down and they were ready to end the service by saying Kel Mole, somebody who worked in the funeral chapel quickly ran into the room and he peeked inside the coffin and he was so embarrassed. And he stood up and he said, I'm sorry, people, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we took out the wrong coffin. I'm sorry. They couldn't believe it. And they rolled this coffin back into the other room where there's so many bodies. And they rolled in another coffin. Okay, we're going to have another funeral. And one of the grandchildren was feeling so sad. A grandchild was ready in their 20s. They were older already. And they felt bad. My grandfather always ran away from honor. Couldn't he get this honor at the last moment of his life? How is it possible? Why did this happen? So on the way out of the funeral for her grandfather, she stopped this granddaughter, stopped by the office, and she said, who was that person that we made a funeral for by mistake and the woman looked up the records and she saw that this was a person who passed away in an apartment who lived in an apartment building in Brooklyn and he passed away four days ago and finally the landlords realized something was amiss and he knocked down the door and we found this person he was he passed away he had no relatives nobody he would have been buried we just brought him here really just to bury him without any fanfare with no words no to your limb nobody saying Please forgive me. Nobody words about him. And by mistake, it worked out that you gave him a beautiful funeral. And this girl, as she walked out, she thanked the lady. She walked out and she says, Grandpa, you had the last lift. Your whole life you've been pushing off honors, always pushing others in front of you. And here, from the other world, you did the same thing. You stepped aside and you allowed that we should give this person a beautiful funeral. So it's an amazing story, but we don't know what Hashem has in plan. We don't know really what he's looking behind the scenes, but he is in control. And therefore, we have to know that it's true. We're suffering with sad tidings. We're hearing news every day. Said Hashem should help to send away the sickness. Hashem should bring back the world the way it should be. We should, of course, appreciate all the small things that we always took for granted. We should only hear of good news and of health and of the world the way we got used to knowing it. We should be able to go back to shul and to yeshiva and to see each other. And Hashem should bench us that we should all be zeichet to a real Chag Sameach, the way it should be. And we should only hear of health and everybody should be well. Hashem should take care of all our families.